Well, it's a beautiful, windy day here today. Perfect day for a sail. Yeah. But we have more important things to tend to, and that, of course, is the third part of our refit. This week, we've got a bit of this. Yeah. <laughs> and a bit of this. Oh, yeah. OK. This is the icing on the cake, the interior and the electrics. When we began to put this mini-series together, we thought it was going to be in three parts, but it's not, is it? No. <laughs> well, we didn't realise until after we started recording how monumental this project was. So this week we were supposed to be covering off not only the interior and the electrics, but also the costs and what we did right and what we did wrong and some advice and so on. But we felt that the interior was going to be something that a lot of you are going to be interested in. And also, of course, the electrics and the navigation system, and they really do warrant their own amount of time. As do discussion on the budget. And we want to give all the details to you in as much detail, actually, as, as we have. Um, and we want to talk about what went wrong and right. I mean, and that's in itself. A whole huge episode. discussion, yes. Yeah. Now, in the past, we were criticised for skirting costs. But don't worry, next week's final fourth episode is going to be dedicated to yes. those costs. So come along with a pencil and a paper <laughs> and make a good note of what it all cost us. Since the bulk of this episode is going to be about the interior, I guess first we should discuss what we were looking for before we started the project. Yes, well, basically it had to be completely changed because, as you've already seen, it was devastated below. So we wanted, first of all, we wanted to lighten up the interior, didn't we? Yeah, Esper's quite dark down below. She doesn't have too much light coming in. She's not a deck saloon like most oysters, so she lacks those uh, big windows. So we knew that she had to have a light interior. Yeah. We wanted it to be modern as well. Yeah. So because it was light, it meant we weren't going to be putting teak everywhere, so it had to be a light colour. And um, that more on a more sort of constructive point of view, there were things like storage in the cabin, for yeah, example. Yeah, we wanted to really sort out the storage issue. It wasn't designed the way we would have liked it. It mm. was more for a weekend cruiser, not for a full livable cruiser. Um, and, the, and the other thing, going back to the interior, we wanted to make it look as wide as possible. Mm. She is quite beamy. She's four mm. metres, so she is quite beamy. So we came up with this idea of running the, the veneer horizontally rather than vertically. Yeah, the other thing we wanted to look at was the rewiring of the boat since we had all the masts down. And because we're putting in new navigation gear, that meant a whole load of rewiring as well. First up, we have the nav area or the chart table. Esper was built with a huge chart table and she originally had a pull-out, swing-out seat, which wasn't particularly comfortable. Oh, it never to sit. worked. It was really difficult. It was, it was really rubbish. stiff. No. Yeah. So we decided to chop that chart table in half and build in a seat. This is the exciting bit, chart table. It's now starting to take shape. So they've sliced it off here. If you remember, it came right out here before and opens up that way. The idea now is that the chart table is going to open up this way. And look, I've got a seat. That was the first major change we made. And of course, as we saw in last week's episode, the other change we made was to get rid of that port light as well. So structurally, those were the two biggest changes. Last week, you saw us start to build those cupboards around that area. And this was one of the major features of the chart table area was to accommodate all the new navigation equipment and of course all the rewiring as well in those cupboards so that was the first thing that Pong worked on was to build up those cupboards. Under the chart table was quite a bit of space so we had the opportunity to put in about 12 drawers they're tiny little drawers like this and they're so useful aren't we put they? all our bits and pieces in there things that you need quickly like mm. all screwdrivers, things like that, um, marlin spikes, keys to everything, um, remotes. They're uh, so useful. I mean, yeah, we use Alan that all, all the time. And in fact, when we were in town, we found some nice chrome handles, which we were able to put on as well, which finished them off quite nicely. Once the three doors of the cupboards were complete, the carpenters then worked with the electricians to start building the fascias for the breaker panel and of course, all the display instruments as well. 
You'll see a bit more about this when we deal with the electricians later on. The new nav station is also Jamie's work area and I was a bit jealous of that so I wanted my <laughs> own work area. And as we had decided to remodel the front it seemed appropriate to make an area there for me to sit and do whatever I need to do. Well, plus the advantages is that you're far enough away that we, I can't see you. We don't actually have to look at each other. <laughs> so on a small boat, just two people, you do need some time apart now and again, and it works really well. So we had to remove quite a few doors. In fact, we removed in total the door from the saloon into the front compartment, the door from that front middle bit into the V-berth, another door on the port side, <laughs> into the right. forward heads. In fact, a fourth door from the forward into the heads. It was, so it was ridiculous. It was, it was ridiculous. And the doors either remained always open or always closed. And once one door was open, you couldn't get into the shower. You had to close the door and so on. It was we, a mess. Yes, and we never used that shower. It was just full of junk. It was full of storage. There was also a second heads there. And to be honest, with two people, we really didn't need that second heads. In fact, what we had been using up until then it for was Millie's loo. <laughs> so she lost her own loo. So we ripped all of that out, ripped the shower out, and we turned the whole area into one nice sized little station for me, my office, affectionately known as the boffis because that's where I boss you around isn't it? Yes <laughs> we've called it the boffis ever since. I think the the most interesting bit of construction work that we did was to put in that curved wall Lovely. and it just it was done so beautifully and it was great to see the uh, carpenters at work there and the way they scored down the, the ply in order to create that curve. You saw it on the cockpit boxes or the deck boxes and they did the same thing inside as well. Just a beautiful finish, isn't yes, it? Yes, it really is. And also, although we'd lost that shower area for storage, we built shelves, so I was able to put a lot of things in there. Behind where I sit on the bench, there's a whole load more storage and underneath. I love it, it's so beautiful. Look at the lighting. Um, this is my table that folds out. Obviously, it's missing the upholstery, but uh, it's done. Upholstery is finished currently being held in our flats so it doesn't get any dirt on it but we've got some great stripy fabric going on here and here but the back so I'll be a little higher. Um, these shelves here and plenty of room here for storage. We were talking about how to keep everything in and decided that uh, we're just going to have nets here for when we're sailing so I can get a lot here and here and here and here and here. Of course underneath our fabulous, fabulous water maker which is going to need uh, servicing before we uh, finish. It was just the right length for our water maker and of course because there's a cushion on top you can simply pull it off and you've got access to literally three sides of that water maker so it means servicing the water maker as well is that much easier. And don't forget that beautiful fold-out table that Ton built me so basically it's flat against the wall when we're underway and then as soon as we anchor as soon as we're somewhere like this bring it back up and I've got a perfectly fitting little table, put my desktop on or whatever it is I need to use. And the other thing you put in was a false floor as well, something to put your feet on when you're yeah. sitting at the desk so your your legs are at the right height in relation to your body and your laptop which is on that uh, on the desk. Yeah, right, works really well and not only that, it allows Millie to have her own perfect little stowaway spot when we're underway. Esper has a number of bunks. I think originally she was marketed as having eight berths or something ri ridiculous yeah, like nine. that. <laughs> and, and in the cabin, there was a little sofa that was actually a third bunk. You could take out a, a little side wall and it became yeah. a third bunk. Yeah. I never understood that. The only th reason I can think of is that it's a young couple with a baby that sleeps there. Maybe, or hot bedding, I don't know. Yeah. It didn't really make much sense it at all. We never sense. used it. It well, just piled up with all your junk. Exactly. Well, more importantly, of course, is that it took up vital storage space. Yeah. And that was one of the main things that we did in the cabin, was to build up the cupboards, uh, specifically on my side, on the port side, so that I ended up with lovely deep cupboards where I could stow all my crap so you don't have to see it. There's still a lot of it <laughs> stowed on top, which annoys me. Well, that was the other thing. Because we built out those cupboards, we got extra storage Loads. space on top. Yeah. So now we put lots of things in plastic boxes. So when we're underway, they're all pretty safe. But yeah. that extra storage in the cabin was 
just yeah. brilliant. Because up until then, we just had a rail uh, that you hung all your clothes mm. on. Uh, that didn't work. That was always falling down in rough <laughs> weather and it would get dusty. Now your clothes are nice and clean in their lockers. One of the interesting things that the carpenters had to tend to was the combing around the top of the bed. It's actually curved like this so it's at an angle and I know Ton and Tui did struggle with it to start with they mm. couldn't work out how to cut the veneer to follow that curve so it took their father Pong the master carpenter to come in and show them how to do it properly and the finished product is very good. One other thing that you'll see in our cabin is a saloon table when it's stowed away. Way back in Turkey we met a couple who had completely done away with their saloon table. Mm. We went into their boat, down the steps, into the saloon, and it was cavernous. It <laughs> seemed so huge, there was so much space in there, and it took us a while to realise that was why. All they had was one small fold-away coffee table, which they brought out when they had guests. Yeah, so we felt inspired by this. Since we were breaking a few minor rules, like you know horizontal veneer and, and so on, uh, we thought, well, how often do we actually use the table? Now we did have a huge table, a fold out table. We, we could you know, seat 10 people around it easily, but we rarely used it. So we thought, ah, let's go with this same idea. I think on Esper, our saloon table is one of the most beautiful examples <laughs> of Pong's work. Yeah. It is just amazing to look at. He built it from scratch. And one of the interesting things he did was to route out a gap underneath the main saloon table to accommodate a coffee table underneath. Yeah, so we have um, nested tables. Nested tables. Oh. The coffee table is propped up by a huge stainless post and that is completely removable and the little gap that's left in the floor we have a plugging cap for and yeah. this was all made by our master stainless man Jung. With the galley there was nothing structural to worry about, we just had to think about the aesthetics because of course that whole load of veneer we had in there was totally f***ed. We decided that we would do something very interesting with the wall between the galley and the cabin, nice big space there, so we chose a bright tomato red glossy veneer. The idea of putting a lovely tomato orange on just one end of the wall just seemed like a bit of fun. So we were going away from the real traditional oaky, timbery look inside and going for something much lighter and modern. Since we were modernising Esper and turning it into a modern inner city apartment, <laughs> uh, we thought we'd go for a brushed stainless effect mm. in the galley, just to, again to just to ring the changes, why not? Now although Liz said there were no structural changes, there was one major change we made and that was to the fridge door. Uh, originally it was uh, it had a hinge in the middle and it could open up from either side which sounds practical on paper but in reality it was a pain in the bum. Yeah particularly when we were underway and I'd be struggling to open one side and then open the other side and you can never find the stuff you needed. It's, it's like one of those old ice cream men. Mm. <laughs> so no I didn't like that at all. So we set Pong to the task of melding those two halves together to make one piece. This involved a lot of fibreglass work of course, but once he'd finished the shape we then set Pong to the task of cutting our new work surface. Now this was a kind of very thick laminate, it's about 10 mil thick, and he was cursing us <laughs> because cutting this stuff was really difficult. Now we just had one lid that opened right up which was great, but the thing was how were we going to keep it up? And we all puzzled about this until Pong, bless him, came up with a beautiful spring that just props the thing up perfectly. Yeah, what you failed to mention was that that spring came from his own work yeah. tool box, which was a huge box they had to cart around in a truck that contained all of his carpentry tools. And this spring came from his box, so that was little Pong's donation yes, to was, Esper's yeah. refit, along, of course, with all the beautiful carpentry that he was involved in. On the theme of brightly coloured laminates, there's our heads. And for some reason, we've decided to go with a lime green uh, laminate on one side 
and a deep purple on the other. Uh, it's cerise, actually, just, just so you get that. Cerise, right. darling. Yeah. yeah. So you've, got, you've got green and cerise, bright pink, opposite. But the rest is white, and mm. it's lovely and light and bright. Now, I think we did get a couple of comments saying, <laughs> isn't this going to induce seasickness when underway? But we've got quite used to it, and uh, we love it. It's yeah. just a bit, of, a bit of fun while you poo. <laughs> Originally we had a slatted teak floor which was removable because there was a well underneath. That's where our original shower was. It was a bit of a pain walking on this and because we had Millie who would frequently use the toilet of course for poos and wheeze, she found it a bit of a problem walking on this. So we decided to put an overlay on top of a solid uh, laminate, the same laminate that we used in the galley. The main thing I wanted to change was the taps because they were pretty old, they were original and she was built in 1988 so you oh. can imagine what kind of state they were in. And not only did I want to change these taps, I wanted to change them to one mixer tap and on top of that I wanted to put a shower within the mixer tap, rather like the ones you see in, um, in the hairdressers, so they put it out and then they push it back. So we were tasked with trying to find one of those and we did. Yes, but we must emphasise that in Asia, of course, not many people have hot taps. Mm. So to find a mixer tap with both a hot and a cold was really quite difficult. Yeah. And we ended up having to import one from Germany. I think what, it was France. Was it France? Yeah. But anyway, uh, the main reason really for the mixer tap was not to shower. <laughs> it was so Liz had a bum wash. Yes, because uh, we prefer not to use paper if we can get away with it, just like they all do in Southeast Asia. And you've got your own little shower right there to use right next to the loo. OK, enough detail. <laughs> we don't need to know any more. With warm water, too. On to the saloon. And again, like the galley, there wasn't too much in the way of structural changes. But one thing we did do was to allow ourselves access to the chain plates. So we built covers for those. The main changes, of course, that we mentioned was the veneer. Uh, we went for this light ash. Uh, but what we did do was to get rid of all the old trim. So all the cupboards used to have an extra trim around it, which to my mind made, made it look a bit old. It was dated, yeah. Yeah. So by getting rid of that, we had much cleaner surfaces. And we also got made little inserts for all the door catches. Yeah. So each and every one of those, again, was made by Jung in the stainless shop. Probably my most favourite thing on the whole of the interior refit is the floor. We had the original sole boards covered in the traditional holly and ash, but they had to go because they were knackered. So we looked at options and we decided to go for teak. Yes, it's dark, but because the whole of the rest of the interior was really bright, we could afford to go for the dark floor. Mm, well, of course, also PSS had it own, its own timber yard, so we were able to source good teak from there. But we did look at other surfaces, including yeah. uh, like vinyl flooring. Yeah, we're looking on those rubber floors yeah. that they have in factories. Quite yeah, like that idea. There were lots of options there, but we figured we'd treat ourselves to a nice teak floor. It was fascinating to watch Pong at work here because he had a real eye for lines. He laid the teak in long planks across the entire length of the floor. So they ran from the saloon all the way through into the forepeak. Mm -hmm. Only after had he laid them, he then cut them down to the size of each individual sole board. This means that the grain runs all the way through the boat and matches every sole board. Perfect. Each plank was epoxied down in place and once it was laid, Tui, the younger of the two brothers, then sanded away the additional epoxy. Each sole board was then removed from the boat and individually varnished by our chief varnisher, Mr. Dang. Talking of varnishing, uh, we made the decision to use polyurethane in the inside of the boat as opposed to varnish. And the main reason for this was because polyurethane is less likely to yellow than traditional varnish. Dang, our chief varnisher, was accompanied by Tong Jam, a very quiet lady who I used to call Cat in the Hat because she always <laughs> wore a stripy cap, not that she would ever understand the reference. But those two worked together for weeks, sanding back each sole board and painting it with the polyurethane, sanding it back a little bit more and so on. And I actually lost count of how many layers of varnish we ended up with. 
The varnishing of the rest of the interior throughout the boat was done at the end once everything else had finished. And again, they took as many bits off the boat as they could to do, and where they had to, they did it in situ. Despite removing all of the old veneer inside the boat, we were actually stuck with some of the original ash because these were structural. And of course there was a slight mismatch between that and the new veneer we were putting up. So how best to deal with it? Liz? <laughs> yeah, I had a look online to try and get some inspiration. I was looking at uh, beachside houses and those kinds of places where they have quite a lot of distressed looking wood. And I reckon that if we sanded it back, painted it and did all of that, we could come up with something that would match our really light veneer. Mm. So we ended up mixing up an emulsion, uh, a water-based emulsion in yeah. fact, uh, painted those bits of ash and then sanded the back to give that distressed look and then Dan came in and varnished them after the fact. Our new companionway steps are a great combination of carpentry and stainless work. The idea was that they sat on top of the battery bank, so the first thing we had to do was to make the stainless framework. After that, Pong was then tasked with making the steps. Now he started with teak that thick because the idea was to eventually put a curve in the teak and the only way he can do that of course was to take back the top bit for the curve and then underneath to follow that curve around. It was To me it was, it was work of art, it was sculpture actually mm. wasn't it? It was more than carpentry, it was absolute perfect sculpture and I think they are right up there as one of my favourite things on the boat. The legs of the framework slot down into two pegs that are mounted on top of the battery box and the tops of the steps slot into two slots. All of this, of course, custom made at PSS. With a beautiful modern saloon looking all pristine and lovely, we had to get rid of that horrible old vinyl ceiling. Oh, it's Ugh. terrible. Narrow stuff. strips. The problem, with that, that problem with that vinyl stuff, it's really difficult to clean, yeah. especially in situ. It's very difficult and it yellows. Yeah, it was, it was re really awful. Uh, the easiest thing to do would have been to just replace that vinyl with another type of vinyl, but no, we didn't want to do it the easy way. <laughs> so we decided to do away with those, go for a more streamlined look by widening the ceiling panels and just go for a very simple matte white laminate. We painted the backs of the panels with Jotomastic 87, which you saw on our hull. That just gave it a bit of waterproofing if there any damp were to end up behind the panels. And then we Velcroed the edges so that we could slot them into place. And then the last thing we did was to make sure that there were channels between each panel so we could put the recessed LED lights in them. As you've seen, the carpentry work inside the boat and a little bit outside as well was a monumental task. So, Liz, uh, costs please? Yeah, well we had between one and three carpenters working on the boat at all times throughout the whole project. We spent around about £11,500 on them for their labour and around about 5000 for materials, so we're looking at around about £16,500. We will go into the full budget properly at the end of this series. On to the electrics. This is another big project. First of all, we're just going to look at the basic charging system. Uh, that was something that just needed to be rewired because over the years it had got more and more complicated. So I went to the YBW forums, that's the Yachting Monthly and Practical Boat Owner forums, and there was a, a user there called PVB, and he had published a simple wiring schematic for the charging system. So that was our basis for the charging system. There was much rewiring to do aboard Esper, uh, but we were able to save quite a bit of the cables inside the boat. Uh, the big project, I think, apart from, of course, the navigation system, was the lighting circuit. And uh, this is something that <laughs> I'm rather obsessed about. You are obsessed with lighting all Lights, the time. torches. Yes. yes. In and every capacity, <laughs> lighting. So I put together a lighting schematic which Sombat, our main electrician, was able to follow. We opted to go with LED strip lights and of course these were recessed into our new ceiling panels. The lighting circuits were broken down into four main regions on the boat, so the fore peak, the saloon, the chart table, toilet, galley area and then the cabin. 
what this meant was that each circuit had a maximum of 10 amps and we actually put voltage regulators on each of those circuits. In the saloon area we opted for three different light circuits so we have the uppers in the ceiling we were able to hide one strip of lights behind the pelmet along the side of the boat and as a special treat we've got mood lighting down on the floor as well. It's really posh, I mean if we're lying on the sofas watching a film it's quite, it's like being in a cinema, I really like it. We just need the usherette to come out with some ice cream. <laughs> uh, we also put a dimmer switch on the LEDs as well. Mm. Since LED strip lights come in all sorts of colours, we were able to install separate red LED lights both above the chart table and in the galley for night passages. Really useful, except when they wired them, they wired them round the wrong way to the, to the switches in the galley, so we now know where they are, but you need them when you're night sailing. We've got two spotlights in the saloon for reading. We've got some nice little side lights in the cabin as well, sort of reading lights and we're able to source light switches from a camping RV store. Back over to the chart table, we extended our breaker panel. And in fact, what we did was we used our old breaker panel, but because we had all these new circuits, uh, we managed to salvage a breaker panel from another boat in PSS yeah. that had been thrown away. This was quite a big cost savings because breaker panels are not cheap. The carpenters worked alongside the electricians to build those new fascias on the chart table cupboard doors. And in fact, Ton and Tui, our carpenters, and Sombat, the electrician, uh, are actually all really good friends. Yeah. So there was a lot of banter going on when these guys were working together. There was one other problem. I'm not sure if you're aware of this when you were away, but Sombat's assistant, whose name escapes me right now, can you remember his name? Anyway, he needed to get some cabling in the galley, and in order to get to it, he ripped out all the new veneer that Tui had put in. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So, what do you do? You just laugh, as they all did, with embarrassment. Um, he put it in, and then poor old Tui had to redo all this blimmin' work he'd done. Idiot. Sombat's work is as beautiful as the carpentry yeah. work. I mean, that the wiring behind those cupboard doors in the chart table is a thing of beauty. <laughs> At this point in time, we hadn't changed our sound system, perhaps the most important uh, electrical item on the boat after the depth sounder. <laughs> depth sounder first, sound system second. <laughs> um, but we had these cockpit speakers and the backs of the cockpit speakers protrude into both the heads and the galley. So we got some little frames made to go over the back of these cockpit speakers and we used this beautifully hand-stitched cloth that we'd picked up in India. I knew it would come in handy at some stage, but we had these little panels, they were about the right size. Mm. Yeah, hand-stitched in Gujarat, we met the woman who did it. Uh, beautiful, they're still there and they're doing really well. Yeah, and they just serve as a nice piece of artwork to cover up the electrics behind it. It was time to renew our navigation system. Some of the displays were starting to go. The hydraulic ram on the steering was no longer working. But we decided to stick with BNG because it's what we knew. And also the new displays now are so bright and colorful. You just found them good uh, for your, your poor eyesight. <laughs> Yeah, they're really good. They are great. In fact, I went over to the Southampton Boat Show and uh, talked to B&G when we were there and looked at the other displays and it, for us, they were the best. And I was really lucky while we were there to do a deal. Yes, and the deal basically was that we were going to be covering this off in our blog. Of course, at the time, neither B&G nor us knew they were going to be featured in the video. Uh, but that was uh, worth mentioning that we got a little deal, but we should make the point that the equipment that we got was the end of the line of their old series, which has since been replaced. But it's the Zeus system, the first generation Zeus system, and we have Triton displays in the cockpit, and those are the nice bright displays that yeah. uh, you can see from standing at the helm. So basically you ripped out the whole of the old system, just to get this clear. We didn't really keep anything from the old days. Was it all new? It was all new. The biggest problem throughout the whole reinstallation of our brand new state-of-the-art BNG navigation system was getting it to Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, massive amount of tax is put on anything you bring into the country and electronics are right top of the list. They love them. So 
in order to get around having to pay a huge amount of money to, to the Thai government for bringing in our own equipment to put in our own boat and then sail away, we were able to set up a bonded warehouse that PSS secured for us. So basically, they say everything that comes in will count and we'll make sure that it all goes out again. This has to go through customs. So they have to get involved. Luckily, Jia, very friendly with a local customs man. And when everything finally arrived, which is another story, he came down and went through everything. He wanted to see absolutely everything in the boxes. And typically, you weren't there. So I had to open the boxes in front of him. We got in, we got about halfway through, no, not even halfway through, half an hour into it, by which time his eyes were doing this. He had no <laughs> idea what he was looking at. And he gave up and he just ticked everything. We slipped him a little and uh, everything was cool. So we had to do the same thing on the way out. The idea was that he was supposed to come back and make sure that all the things he'd seen were on the boat and were leaving Thailand, which he sort of did. He just, again, just signed it. But getting everything from B&G to Thailand was a mammoth headache for me. I almost would have preferred not to have had the discount just to get it there. But anyway, that's another story which we won't go into. In terms of the equipment that we have installed, we have a Zeus 12-inch touchscreen MFD multifunction display that sits down at the chart table. We then have a second chart plotter at the cockpit binnacle and that's a Zeus 7 inch that isn't touch screen and a uh, little bit of advice there touch screens even ones designed for the marine environment can be a bit troublesome in wet weather so we opted to go for a plotter that had push buttons in the cockpit itself. The 12 inch touch screen acts as the master and the 7 inch acts as the slave. We have the two Triton displays which sit behind us in the cockpit box. We have the wind instrument at the top of the mast of course and a DST through hull fitting that's depth, speed and temperature. The other thing we opted for was B&G's 4G radar. Uh, the two reasons for this, well three in fact, the first is that uh, it's much more efficient in terms of power usage. Second reason was that our previous radar had crapped out after getting struck by lightning in India and the third reason, of course, is that we can overlay that 4G radar data onto our chart plotters. Like most modern navigation systems, this runs via Ethernet, so it has a backbone that runs throughout the boat. And we also installed a go-free modem, which allows us wireless access to the NEMA 2K data. Although we didn't install it in the refit, we do now have a Vespa 6000 AIS, which we're also able to overlay on the chart plotter along with the 4G radar data. And we installed a new autopilot with a new hydraulic ram. All of this has made an incredible difference when you're at the helm. In fact, it's like being on a completely different boat up until this time with no radar and with no auto helm. We were doing everything by hand and all of a sudden when we left, didn't have to do anything, just kind of set it, you could see everything, it was all there in the cockpit, it's amazing. Electrics, electronics, big project. As we said, we got a good deal from B&G, but we also made a very big saving uh, with Sombat, the electrician. Yeah, he very kindly agreed to do the job in his off time because he was working on a really big boat and he would just come along and do the bits that he could for us when he could. So he brought the price down a bit and he said he would do the entire job, everything that we've just talked about for a thousand pounds, but he would do it in his own time when he could. We were very happy with that. We knew we were going to be there for ages. So it's a thousand to Sombat and I think, what, well, yeah, nine thousand pounds to B&G, that's with a very good discount for everything that we got. Plus all the extra cabling yeah. and oh, other, yes. other things as yeah. well. So about £10,000 for all of that. That, I think, bargain of the century? Yes. Esper is now looking new with beautiful top sides, a shiny new deck, masts, and an interior to die for. There's just one last thing we've got to do. Put it all back together. Put it all back together, yep. So this was quite a long process. It was just Ton, one of the carpenters and myself who did this. I've actually lost count of how many deck fittings Esper has, but every single one that went through the deck uh, that had to be done up in the ceiling inside the boat had to be cut down because of course we had removed the deck and that meant the depth had changed. So that in itself took a long time, cutting each bolt to the right size. Mm. 
pretty much most holes were refilled with chopped up fiberglass and epoxy. Every hole was then re-drilled, countersunk, and then for most of the deck fittings we used butyl tape. Now we spent quite a bit of time talking about this in the original refit series. Uh, it's really, really easy stuff to work with. Very cheap, um, it's fairly non-adhesive, so it does mean that if you need to take out deck fittings again, it's very easy to do that. Yeah, so if you're interested in fitting your deck fittings with butyl tape, go back to the original series because we did, I think, literally a whole episode on laying down our tracks. If I can find it, I'll put it in the description. Yeah. Talking of butyl, we used a product called Arbormast. I think it's made in the UK. This is a butyl-based sealant, uh, which you get in a tube, so you use a gun. And we used that on all the port lights. Uh, it didn't require any kind of adhesion, it was just the sealant that was required. So I can recommend that if you can get hold of it. Since we're talking about deck fittings, there is one deck fitting that's definitely worth a mention, and those are our beautiful fair leads. Oh, stainless steel, stunning, really nice, yeah. Made from scratch by Mr. Jung, our stainless guy at PSS. We've given you a few costs in this video, but what we need to do is a whole budget uh, for the whole project, and there isn't enough time to do that properly and to do it justice right now. So the next video will include the entire budget and we'll cover everything, including things outside the project. So we had to yeah, pay like for living expenses. Cost, cost of living is an important Yeah, one, daily it? expenses. Uh, we hired scooters to get us backwards and forwards. We went home, back to the UK, there was flights. There's a whole load of other things that go round um, the budget that you have to think about if you're going to do something like this. Yeah, so we'll cover that off and then we'll also cover off what worked and what didn't. Yeah, that's quite a big one. It yeah, is. Um, um, what's happening right now and what we've done since, since then. And we'll answer some questions, I think, as well, won't we? We've had quite a lot of questions from people on FTB Mates and, in Pat and from Patreons and here. Uh, we'll get through as many as we can. If you've got a question, put it in the comments. If we have time, if we're able to, we'll try and answer it on camera. So yeah, big wrap up in the next video. Exciting stuff. Yeah, it's going to be good. All right. In the meantime, peace and fair winds. Was at one end we put. Uh, uh, we then tasked teak floor because teak floor because this was that you could pull out rather like the ones you see. Blech.